in the morning, and then there was this ray of sunshine right at this particular moment of the day. So somebody must be looking out for us, and I think it's us. It's Sunday assembly. <laughs> Uh, there's a place called Burning Box, Burning Box, where you can uh, buy some all flavored beans, 
and uh, if you take like a lion meat, it'll turn into a lion, and, uh, and just all kinds of magical things can happen. And we're playing today for magic, a very much magic things. And you know, you're here, might be lemon flavored, you might be earwax, we don't know. So they're in there. This is for the winner. Also, uh, I have some stickers for the run of ups. I'm hoping that I can confuse you all so there are no runner ups, but uh, you look like a tough crowd. So let's get started. Um, we are playing Simon Says. The rules for Simon Says are uh, every command, every statement, every request I make must be preceded by Simon Says. Anything else out, and you're out. I should uh, find out how many people who know I have Simon Says already by show of hands. Okay, then you should know better. You're out, you're out, you're out. You're out. You're out. You're out. You're out. Okay. 
paper, scissors. Simon says rock, paper, scissors. One, two, three. Uh, rock to rock, that's a tie. Uh, paper, scissors beat paper, you see now. Uh, rock to rock, that's a tie. And I here, okay, we're going to go again. Rock, paper, I'm oh, sorry, ready? Here we Simon says, let's go. One, two, three. Paper to paper there. Rock to paper, you're sitting down. Rock to rock. You need two pair of seconds and you need two pair of Okay, we're getting down to the final, uh, the final uh, six people, and this is getting very exciting now. Seven, six, rock, paper, scissors. One, two, three. We have a winner here. We have a winner here. And we have a winner here. Okay, now this is a little bit tough here. Is that a tie or that was a uh, paper to sit down? You just got paper and you have a Second ten. <laughs> okay, we're gonna go round rock and turn again. Uh, one here, one here, and then two here. Second says rock paper scissors. One, two, three. Nice. Well, that's the scissors. You can go sit down right here, but I got a nice uh, sticker for you. That's a very good job. Nice job, there. Now the parents who 
anyone who took a driver's ed class like the one you took is probably going to kill himself or someone else or a score of people the first time he takes the car out for a spin. And here's the neat part. Well, it's the neat part for your driver's ed instructor anyway. Did you kill yourself or someone else the first time you drive a car? Or the second or third or even the 300th time, your old driver's ed instructor will cite your death as good that he was right about driving. <laughs> While strict abstinence only sex education programs get all the bad press, and for many years all of the federal funding to the tune of billions of your tax dollars. What we think of as comprehensive sex ed programs often aren't much better. It's easy to say that pleasure should be included in any comprehensive sex ed program, but pleasure is difficult to talk about, much less teach, as pleasure is subjective and personal. And when it comes to sex, pleasure is contested. It isn't even acknowledged in most religious traditions as a legitimate reason to have sex. So I don't want to come down too harshly on sex educators, actual sex educators, not those abstinence only frauds, who find themselves trapped between the competing demands of curious, hormone pickled adolescents, naturally conservative parents, nervous school administrators, and skittish boards. Like I said, I understand how difficult it is to talk about pleasure. I understand from personal experience. Full confession, I screwed up the sex talk with my one, the one and only child I was specifically charged with educating about sex, my own. One day my then eight-year-old son came into the kitchen and jumped onto the counter. He narrowed his eyes and gave me a strange look. Two men can't make a baby, DJ finally said. <coughs> That's true, I told him, two men can't make a baby. Then you and daddy have sex for no reason, he said. <laughs> for no reason, or more accurately, for a very good reason, for pleasure. And yet almost all parents, myself included, leave pleasure out of the talk. And if a sex advice columnist who believes that pleasure needs to be incorporated into sex education leaves the pleasure out of himself, can you blame sex educators for that issue? But if you're not making a baby, my son asked, why would you want to do it? Because it feels good, I told him. Because it makes you feel close to another person. Because your body is programmed to want to be. It looks so stupid, DJ. <laughs> he was talking about the couples he'd seen kissing on television. Wait until he stumbles on the internet for at the time. He has no idea just how stupid people can look at <laughs> But he was right. Sex does look stupid. We look ridiculous doing it and feel a little ridiculous once we're done. And 15 minutes later, we're ready to do it again. <laughs> I've been writing a sex advice column for two decades, and my email box is stuffed letters from teenagers. They don't ask me about reproduction. They don't ask me how to get a condom on a banana or anything else. The questions I get from teenagers are almost entirely about sexual pleasure. They want to know how to find sex partners. They want to know what their sex partners will expect from them. They want to know what they have a right to expect from their sex partners. They want to know how to tell if they're good at sex or how to get better at sex if they suspect that they're bad at it. Most are relieved when I tell them that no one is good at this. Nobody is any good at sex at first. Sex is a skill that takes time, practice, experimentation, and self-discovery to acquire. They want to know what to do if they're turned on by something odd but relatively harmless, stuffed animals, feet, and what to do if they're turned on by something scary and invariably harmful, actual animals, children. We often tell young people that curiosity about sex is normal and natural, but the culture sends messages that are louder, less empowering, and more destructive. Girls, girls are told that there's something wrong with them if they're too interested in or curious about sex. And boys are told that they're supposed to know everything about sex. Girls feign disinterest and boys feign mastery. And the results, at least in the United States, again, highest teen pregnancy rate needed to be in the developed world, have been disastrous. Yet many American adults have convinced themselves that ignorance about sex is both a virtue and a spiritual force field. No single question asked in the classroom during a comprehensive and free-ranging sex ed course will be as important as asking of questions itself. When they have questions later in life, when they're out in the adult world negotiating sex with other adult partners, a person who is empowered to ask questions of a child is likely to keep asking questions as an adult. 
We should think of our sex lives as high hostage situations in which we are at once the hostage, the hostage negotiator, and the hostage taker. No one escapes his or her sexuality. Just Google Ted Packard male escorts or David Vitter female escorts. But we can learn to live with and take pleasure in our sexualities. While at the same time minimizing the risks for STIs, unplanned pregnancies, and emotional harm by being considerate of others' feelings and by insisting that others be considerate of ours. But to do that, you're going to need to learn to communicate and communicate honestly with yourself and then with your partner or partners. And you can't do that if you're incapable of asking and answering questions. But young or old, don't delude yourself. You don't have sex. Sex has you. Buckle up. Yeah. <laughs>
Okay, um, what that means is, is that everybody's going to have a different experience of sexual health. There are definitely facts, you know, like STIs, like herpes, you know what I mean? Um, what different birth control methods are. But a lot of it has to do with your personal preference. And what's right for you may not be right for somebody else. We always start out talking about absence. We, we talk about how that is a choice, it's an option. But maybe that's not for you. Maybe it is for you. It's something for you to decide. And that's definitely something we really push for these kids. Is it's important for you to make those decisions with yourself and your partner and make sure you're comfortable with that. And the last one, admitting what we don't know. I do not know everything about sexual health. I know a great deal, but I do not know everything. And so the other big thing is that we always try to stay really honest with these kids. We're, you know, if we don't know the answer, that's a great question. Let me find out for you. And we definitely do. We follow up with those things. Trauma-informed. Have you guys have ever heard of that term? Trauma-informed? No? Somebody? Okay, no one. Um, Trauma-informed. <laughs> Trauma-informed. It's actually the philosophy of St. Louis Services. Is, uh, we're a trauma-informed agency. Meaning that when we go into teaching something like sexual health, um, we understand that everybody's going through something in their lives where they're going to take this information differently. Everybody experiences trauma, whether it be, you know, they were bullied in high school all the way up to childhood sexual abuse. It depends. And so when we go into a classroom, we definitely approach all of these kids, and, and even, even the adults, um, with that understanding that the way that they're going to take this information and the reactions they might have, and the questions that they might have, isn't really about us. It's definitely a reaction um, based on what they've been through. So we just try to keep this in mind whenever we're answering any questions. Sexual health, uh, lastly, isn't just about um, teaching, like I said, isn't just about teaching them about STIs and all the different pregnancy prevention things there are, it's a holistic approach. It's not just about facts, it's also about answering those emotional questions. Kind of like Laura mentioned in her reading, it's about answering those emotional questions like, am I okay? Is this okay for me? What should I do about this? And looking at it in a whole realm, like we're not just an individual, we also have our partners and you know our past to think about and different things, all, all those things into it. So our curriculum is actually technically 16 lessons. Um, but we do it in eight weeks. Um, we cycle through two different high schools. Um, in one of the high schools, it's segregated classrooms, boys and girls. And the other one, it's mixed. I definitely prefer the mixed, because um, the kids act a little bit more mature. Um, we start off with abstinence, and then we move into refusals. Refusals, um, we basically <coughs> have to say no if you aren't ready to have sex. Um, and we cover consent in that lesson as well. And then delays. We talk about delays, how to put off having sex until maybe you're ready. Um, and then we talk about birth control methods, all of them, and we do a fun condom demonstration. Uh, we also do, uh, I think the next lesson is just all role plays. We really encourage the kids to practice talking to their partners, because a lot of this isn't just about knowing your facts, but it's about having those tough conversations. Because a lot of kids feel awkward or weird about talking to their partners about putting, you know, using a condom, and that's totally normal. I, I definitely, you know, used to feel awkward about talking about those things too but it's all through practice, so we definitely encourage the role plays. And then it's STIs, we do a lesson on HIV, and then we conclude with how, what kind of structure should you put in place in your life to help you stick with whatever, whatever decision you want to make. So if you decided to stay absent, it would be great. How can we help you stay absent to down the road? If you decided to have sex, great. How can we help you um, get things in place so you're you know, being safe about it and that you have safe outlets for all of that? Okay. So, we have my favorite portion of the class is called the anonymous questions. Um, and there's two categories for this that we always get. We get the questions of is it normal and then how to. The anonymous questions is the part where we have kids, they can write down a question on a sheet of paper and they turn it into us and then we answer it next class. It's a great opportunity to ask anything they want. Um, but like I said, the questions fall between two categories. And it's actually kind of typical too because we all have these concerns ourselves. So is it normal? Is it normal that I'm attracted to BDSM? Is it normal? Is my penis size normal? Is my vulva size normal? Is, you know, all these different things. People search for validation. People search for, is it okay? Am I okay? And so we always answer the questions in the way that, you know, somebody says, what's the normal penis size? And we say, well, you know, average is about 3.5 to 5.5 inches. Um, but, and that's, that's flaccid, and then, no, that's right. Um, uh, that's correct. And, but we always follow that up with, but here's the thing, penis size isn't everything. You need to 
talk to your partners. You need to have that conversation because people have this confusion. They think that sexuality is just about putting a penis into a vulva and that's it. And they just go off and have it. I'm like, no, there's so much more. There's talking, there's foreplay, there's a whole lot of other stuff involved. And so kind of easing those fears with those kids, especially around things like that, or is my breast size normal, or I'm attracted to these kind of people, is that normal? We always try to ease those. And then my favorite how-to, how to put on a condom. How do I do, how do I have sex in these different positions and things like that? We don't answer those because we say just experiment and try it out. Um, <laughs> just encourage them to use their imagination. And they do. They do. <laughs> so when, we, when I first came into the curriculum, um, we, we just taught it exactly how it was. And then I think it came, I started in September, um, not this September, but two years ago. And uh, we noticed that there's a lot of improvements that needed to be made. Um, the first one was yes means yes. So the talk about consent. How many of you guys have ever heard the phrase no means no? A lot of us, okay? But there's this movement now in, sex in sexual health to yes means yes. Meaning that when we're talking about consent, we're looking for an active yes. Not a no, we're not looking for a refusal, we're not looking for somebody to say no. Because sometimes, I mean, why would somebody be afraid to say no to sex? Does anybody want to tell me? Why would somebody be afraid to have sex? Don't say no. Being considered a Yeah, maybe they feel like being considered rude, maybe they're intimidated, that's a really good one. There's a lot of reasons why somebody might be afraid to say no. So we would encourage the kids to look for the active yes. The reason for this, we had, um, several anonymous questions uh, that we got in our box that were incredibly concerning. Um, the first time that we we taught at Tealens High School, we were teaching in the boys' classrooms, and we started getting a lot of violent questions um, towards women. You know, there was in the boys' class, and they were asking, you know, all kinds of things, and I won't repeat them because they were somewhat uh, difficult to handle, but basically asking how to do certain violent acts towards women to put them in pain. And this happened on more than one occasion. So we got to the point where I started off the class one day and wrote up all these violent things up on the board. You know, choking, spitting. Actually, I asked the kids which ones to put up there. Choking, spitting, you know, murder, stabbing, all that kind of stuff. And then I said, how many of you guys have sisters? How many of you guys have aunts? Mothers, do you have any friends that are girls? Okay, which one of these would be okay to do to one of them? And it started a great conversation with these boys because they started to understand that some of the violent things they were saying were affecting us. But it didn't stop there. The same lesson, we do this thing called the timeline where we talk about, um, we talk about meeting somebody and then sex. And we talk about all the stuff that happens in between them. Because kids a lot of times say, sex just happened. I'm like, what, you were in a bus stop with a fan, you were naked? Like, it never sex? No, no, no. There was stuff that happened. So we talked about this timeline, and I asked them, I said, what point in this timeline is it okay for your partner to say no to having sex? And they were like, oh, well, they can say no before we're alone in the room, but not after. And about 80% of the class said this. And I was like, so if you're in the middle of having sex, the person can't say no? Of course. And they were all like, no, of course not. You know, they were already doing it. They agreed. That's when the big red light came on. And I was like, okay, we're going to stop. And we actually and we had a whole conversation about consent um, and what that means. So consent, verbally giving your permission to somebody to go ahead and do something. And not just giving it once, but checking in with that person consistently. Is this okay? Do you like it? Do you, is it okay if I continue? That kind of thing. So that was probably the biggest, the biggest change that we made. And it was wonderful because the team, my team really came together. Um, I teach with co-facilitators and I love them. They're most wonderful people in the world. Um, and we're really dynamic together. It's phenomenal. I wish they could have been here. But um, we teach together and they all came together and we made this plan to how to make this <coughs> The other part is sexual assault and rape. So we had, again, several anonymous, always starts with the anonymous questions because that's how you're going to know what's important to the kids. That's how you're going to know what they actually want to know about. So we had this girl um, at Steel Canyon and she asked one question, and I actually have it uh, here with me. But she asked the question, is it normal for me to be afraid of having sex? 
And, you know, we mentioned, we said, no, you know, like, I mean, like, yes, it's normal to be afraid, you know, just have to talk to your partner. Her follow-up question was, I was raped when I was a little girl with my uncle, and now I'm afraid that I never want to have sex again. What do I do? And that's when we realized that there's such a huge need in these schools to not just focus on the health part of it, not just talking to them about birth control and STIs, but talking about the stuff that really matters, which is stuff like consent. Where do you go when you get sexually assaulted? Or who can you talk to? What's going to happen when you do that? Talking about the process. So that's something that we definitely incorporated into that because it's so important and it happens. It's one in three women in their lifetime will experience sexual assault or rape, and it's one in six men. And that's always the biggest statistic that you know gets the boys going, what? How can men be raped? Blah, blah, blah. And I shut that down right away because I'm like, no, it's a horrible thing that happens, especially in our society. Men feel so ashamed and so put down when it comes to things like that, and it should never be that way because we're an equal society. We respect everybody, and no matter who's experienced sexual assault or rape, it's going to devastate them just the same. And they can also recover from it just the same. Um, but a lot of times, they don't have as much help. So we focused on that a lot, and we, we had to reach out to this young woman, um, and she ended up going to the counselor and getting some uh, further legal action taken care of. So hopefully, but we don't know how that ended up turning out, um, but it was a great time to talk with her. Unfortunately, this isn't the only question we ever get. We get these questions every single time we teach, which is a lot. Um, and we get them several times in those cycles of eight weeks. This isn't just an issue that is in the back of their, you know, back burner. It doesn't really happen. It's something that needs to be talked about. It happens a lot. We had another one with a student who was being pressured to have sex by a teacher at her school, and she was afraid. There's so many of these things happening. Sexual health needs to be, this specific topic needs to be talked about. Something that I really like to bring up, especially to parents' knowledge, is that now the California State Legislature has passed a bill saying that sexual health um, education can include information on rape and sexual assault as well as human trafficking. The parents, though, need to ask their school board to do that. So people like myself can't go into school board and be like, you need this. The parents need to ask for it. So that's something for you to know about. Um, they're now looking over how to officially adopt this into the California curriculum. But please, if you do have kids or if you have your aunt or uncle, um, please reach out to your school board and talk to them about including this in, in their education. The other one is LGBTQ issues. Um, our curriculum was horribly lack uh, when it comes to LGBTQ issues. Um, LGBTQ, for those of you who don't know, stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or questioning. There's other um, acronyms, there's other letters that go on here as well, um, but this was the shortest one for my purposes. Um, our first lesson actually, we start out talking about, and this is something that hadn't been included, um, but because my team is just amazing, we came together like this needs to change. So we put in a whole thing um, called the gender bread person. How many of you guys have ever heard of the gender bread person? Yes, wonderful. Okay, so the gender bread person is my favorite person. Um,
consent. The other ones would be things like pornography. So we get a lot of questions like, is pornography bad? Uh, our questions always fall into, you know, is it normal? Or is it okay? Or is it bad? And when we talk about pornography, our typical answer is, um, as long as you're able to still have a social life, and you're able to go outside, and you can still have friends, sitting in masturbation, and not consuming your life, it should be fine. But we always encourage them that a lot of the standards that we see in pornography um, are not realistic, um, that don't all look like Barbie. Um, and so we always try to encourage these people to have realistic expectations, even when they are doing pornography, um, something that we find really important. The other one is the boys versus girls. And again, the reading kind of touched on this, but a lot of times when we go into the boys' classrooms, they assume, they, they think they know it all. They're like, oh yeah, I've got this. And I'm like, and we start sharing information, like, oh wow, I didn't, I didn't know that there was a whole other thing besides the vaginal opening. There's a, what's that? And we, there, you know, there's a whole lot of more information there to be included. Um, and then, that's why I like the mixed classrooms, because usually they don't act as so. Um, the other ones would be trafficking, human trafficking. It is a huge issue here in San Diego. And it's something we've included in our curriculum as well as so we talk about it, how, what some of the warning signs are, um, and how to keep a lookout for, um, I guess, people who could potentially be victims. It's something I really encourage you guys to look into. There is going to be a wonderful documentary tomorrow, sorry, shameless plug, um, called The Path of Peers. So please check that out. It's going to be a wonderful presentation. Um, some of the other issues would include dating violence and childhood abuse as well. Um, again, these are things that are, you wouldn't think, are a part of sexual health or a part of sexual education, um, but they should be, and they definitely should be. And I encourage any of you guys who end up talking to any youth or really involving yourself with any youth that these are issues, and especially us as adults too, is understanding that we have all gone through trauma, we've all gone through experiences, and that's going to influence how we interact with the world. That's going to experience how we take in information and process information. And it's something to consider when thinking about our own sexual preferences and sexual choices. So last but not least, the biggest thing that we really push is that sexuality is a huge part of people's human experience. And it should be delighted in and a subject of exploration. There is no shame in healthy sexuality. Sexuality has been such a shamed topic in our society, it's something that nobody talks about. And I wish that we would talk about it more, and I'm glad that we have the opportunity to talk about it today. I love what I do, and I love the job that I have, because I'm able to normalize a topic for kids that's usually, you know, giggled behind, they don't talk about it. We're able to normalize it. When we ask, when they answer their, when we ask their question, answer their questions, they are able to see adults who don't think it's weird, or don't think that they're odd, or whatever it may be, we take it seriously. We're like, hey, you know, that's okay, it's fine. Um, so, if any of you guys are interested, there is a wonderful basket of condoms in the back. I apologize, there's no lube, um, but hopefully, uh, hopefully that can make your experience today all the better to get a free gift. Um, does anybody have any questions that they'd like to submit to the front? Questions? No. That's a great question. So we do sexually transmitted infections versus sexually transmitted diseases. So it, first of all, it's more uh, accurate. The other one is it doesn't sound scary like you're going to catch a blind leg because STIs again are a uh, subject that's shamed a lot. So if you get chlamydia or gonorrhea or herpes, we're like, look, it, that happens. If you're not, you're fine. Like you're not going to die. Just get it treated and it, you'll live. It's not going to be the end of your world. We just try to make it very normal and not make people feel ashamed of their bodies and ashamed of who they are. That's the biggest thing. Yeah. Um, not to compete with you, right? <laughs> uh, we put our second younger daughter through um, the sex ed program at the Unitarian University's Church over here in New Our whole lives, uh, we call it OWL. And I don't know what, I don't know.
So I don't know if that's repeating what you're saying, uh, but it's something you, you might want to check out. Just to
about doing their best. And this could be you. We'd love to hear your personal stories. We've had some great stories last time. We heard a story about somebody who got run over by a car and went and voted, which is fantastic. <laughs> and today we're going to hear from Aaron Eaglebach, who's going to tell us about climbing Mount Fuji. Aaron? Photo 
but we weren't up all the mountain yet. And we had that goal. We really wanted to, to make it to the top of Mount Fuji. We wanted to see not just the initial sunrise, but we wanted to see the sun from the top of Mount Fuji. So we pressed on. And we took it upon ourselves to push through the crowds of people that were setting up for the photo and making camp right there on the mountain <coughs> and get to the peak of the summit. We were gung-ho, we wanted to do our best. Well, 20 minutes after that first photo, it started getting light, and we were just ever so close. And we had to pick up our pace. We were tired, we were exhausted. We should have done this. In there two hours earlier, and we were really truly for honest with ourselves and our, our climbing ability, we were not experienced climbers. But thankfully, I made it to the peak with my friends. Now, in Japan, they call the mountain Mount Fuji, or Fuji Song Fuji. Those of you that are familiar with the Japanese people might hear the song portion of that and think that it's a monorific, that they kind of anthropomorphize Mount Fuji as a king. And while that may be true if you hold a Shinto belief, and that they associate a, a, a spiritual deity with it, it's more of a term that derives from the Chinese usage and the origin of the word mountain. But as that sun rose, and we were enveloped in this warm light that just blanketed the entire area around us with this feeling of, of presence. One cannot help but just feel like you were in touch with something else. And that there was a meaning to that struggle that you just went through. And that you indeed were connected to something. Now, on our way down, it's just spectacular. You have undertaken this journey, you have undertaken this, this exhausting one step forward and one step back of a 13,000 foot volcanic peak. But let me tell you, this was the best part of all. Beyond the sunrise, beyond the, the, the wonders of, of the struggle, this is loose, you can't quite tell, but soft volcanic sand. It's very cushy, very slippy slide, and you can actually surf almost down the side of the mountain. Now, if you go too fast, you risk plummeting off and rolling down. But uh, thankfully, they have the same switchbacks back and forth all the way down. So it's not too bad, but it took us about seven hours to wind up and an hour and a half coming down. <laughs> So if you're ever in Japan, oh, wow. or if you've ever uh, been curious about climbing a mountain, I <coughs> that uh, truly for me, uh, this was an experience that I look back on and I, 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 I think about the struggle that it took to, to do it. And uh, one step forward, half step back, and I, I connect that uh, to my own life. I think, oh, well, I, I might be taking a step forward in everything I do. Let's up on my tread the water. And I know if I reach that summit, I'm going to reach out to those around me. The way down, it's not so hard.
parents to have a child that's uh, in college and out of the house. It's just nice to hear a moment of silence, children in the background, which you know, tickles me. It's really neat. Um, I, I, this is the part of the assembly where the uh, MC makes an address, and uh, uh, usually I share a personal story that's uh, uh, topical for the sex assembly. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to tell you that uh, I'm a people person. I, I like watching people, I enjoy it. It's uh, I work in a place, a uh, large wholesale warehouse club in San Diego where uh, I see between 7,000 and 15,000 people a day, and I really enjoy watching people. So, I'm going to talk today about hands, uh, which, uh, you know, it's thematic. I think we can all agree with that. But uh, the thing I wanted to say about this specifically is I always like to watch the gestures that people make when they're talking. And I'm really conscious of using my hands while I'm talking right now, but I use my hands a lot. Um, but uh, when people are describing things that they're looking for, I had a gentleman the other day who was looking for peaches. And, you know, it really helped me to tell me he wasn't looking for fresh peaches, he wanted peaches in the jar. And um, last week, a woman was looking for a flameless plant candle. And I guess that, you know, it highlighted the word flame, but kind of was opposite of what she was looking for, but uh, it was really cool. And um, uh, just last week, a woman was looking for uh, applesauce. Um, we, um, but this 
costs and costs. So we appreciate, particularly if you're doing a, a recurring donation, that's what we're really looking for, $5 a month or whatever you can afford, you can go on to uh, the computers at the back of the building that are set up for that, and then also um, we have PayPal card swipers, uh, whatever uh, you can do. It's very, very helpful and helps us keep uh, Sunday Assembly going. Um, there is so much happening coming up. Uh, we, there's the sexual health workshop that we uh, mentioned. Um, Earth Fair planning is it's, it's happening. That's uh, February, April 19th. Last year we had an Earth Fair uh, booth in the park, and it was fantastic. Um, the Resolve Scoop is starting again. So if you resolve to walk more, or lose weight, or ride your bike, or anything that you want uh, a community of people to support you, um, this is a great event. And it starts, uh, they resolve to start again um, on the 28th. That's at 10:30, and uh, Sandra can give you more information about that. We have a cross stitching scoop that'll be actually happening after this assembly. It's usually around 11 or 12 o'clock on Sunday, but it'll be 2 o'clock today. And that happens at Panera down in uh, Liberty Station. 2.30. Um, 2.30, excuse me. A little extra time to go to the uh, 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 next door. Um, there's, there's a family dinner that happens Saturday night before Sunday assembly. So we had it last night. It was a mutual study. You can check out different restaurants. We all get together. Uh, Commiserate and schmooze and not necessarily talk about Sunday assembly like we always do when we're together, so we're, uh, we're just having fun. A food bank happens every first Thursday of the month, and that happened again last uh, Thursday. Um, there's an estuary cleanup in Tijuana that is March 14th, Saturday at 9 a.m. We hope you join us. We've done a bunch of which cleanups, and it is a uh, super fun, uh, great way to benefit the community and help out them. Um, our March assembly is, uh, what date is that? Let's see, how can I tell? I can get one of these handy dandy calendars that's in the back of the room there. Um, our March uh, assembly is uh, March 22nd, so please put this on your refrigerator and please do attend. We'd love to see you here. Um, the physics of free will is the uh, topic of the day. Let me see if there's anything I missed. I know there's a drag uh, and a dime. It's on the 4th of March. And, and stand up for kids' dinner, which is happening. Can you tell me that it's going? Yeah, we did that at Christmas time, and it's fantastic. Or around the same 25th, I should say, it's probably the solstice. Solstice, that's right, that's what we did, it's a solstice. And we had a big solstice celebration here. And then this one's birthday. Yes, good and better. Um, so, unless I forgot to say anything, I think we'll go right to uh, Paul here, who's going to um, actually want to be Paul. We're going to see this on the screen. Last time we're seeing his right side of the I'm too sexy. <laughs> And then let's sing along again, so thank you. Okay, we just stand by. We have a little technical moment here. Okay, well, while you're doing that, let's go over something that I skipped out, which was uh, life happens. So if any of you have anything happening in the last uh, between assemblies, please let us know. Um, Travis Pat told me he finally found his apartment. He's been going to work. He had to come to the church. He was looking to sit there. He is here. Congratulations, Travis. You've been working hard on that. Brendan is celebrating another year around the sun. Happy birthday, Brendan. <laughs>
Italy, Ricky Tavisoli, San Diego. We're going to be uh, 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 joining each other at Pizza Cotto right after this. We have the breakdown Sunday in LA, but we always have a meal after. So uh, we get to be here next time, and uh, we hope to see you over there. Thank you.